get the first slide. Well, welcome, and uh, I hope I get past the postprandial depression here. Uh, I would like to welcome you to the Milky Way, but it's not showing up. Can someone turn on my, my slides? There we go. So in case you were wondering, you are here. And uh, if we want to take a little more uh, a closer look at where we really are, uh, we're in this type of situation. And it says at the top, population growth throughout history. And that, that uh, statistic is pretty steep, particularly in the last couple of hundred years. And as we look at the rate of uh, population growth on the planet, we look at the challenges that that poses, we certainly are uh, we're looking at a growing, hungry world. And to meet the challenges that this relationship uh, presents, we need to understand all aspects of life processes. And to do that, we have to understand molecules. And it probably begins with this one, DNA. And more particularly and broadly, the central dogma that Dr. Vover taught me, which is that DNA is transcribed to RNA, which is translated to protein. And the course of this event from DNA to protein is, a, is, is actually a program. And when we disrupt that program, we disrupt the trajectory of gene expression. And you can have fairly severe consequences for form and function, leading to disease and other types of problems. So the Milky Way that I want to talk to you today about is this one. Milk. It's what makes us mammals, and it's what makes our work translatable from animal to man and back again. Milk. Now, milk actually is known to contain biologically active factors, which is what it says at the top. I can see it here. Uh, these factors, in, uh, beyond, beyond nutrients, uh, include proteins such as this one, relaxin, which we have identified in the milk of pigs, our preferred experimental animal through our, uh, our research program. It's known that there's abundant bioactive relaxin in the milk of pigs within the first few days after they give birth. And moreover, when baby pigs are allowed to nurse, this same molecule shows up in their circulation. This means that the relaxin molecule, which is bioactive, is transmitted from mother to offspring in the milk. This is a, not an endocrine, but instead a lactocrine mechanism. And we actually coined this English word to describe a mechanism through which milk-borne bioactive factors, exemplified by relaxin, are delivered from mother to offspring as a specific consequence of nursing. And so while there may not be exactly information in milk, there are signals in milk that can affect the course of gene expression, and in fact, the course of patterning of a number of important life processes. And so we're talking about developmental trajectory, not necessarily at the level of the whole biosphere, but certainly at the level of cell-cell interactions that ultimately dictate how genes are expressed and what becomes of this little ball of cells that could have become any one of us at any given time. When we talk about developmental trajectory, we talk about the development of form. And there are critical periods early in development that, if disrupted, can change the course of a program of development, sometimes with surprising and not altogether desirable consequences when pigs fly, in this example. Now, the tissue I'm going to talk to you about today is the endometrium, or in the, whatever it says up there at the top. And, and this is a tissue that lines the uterus and provides sustenance for embryos and fetuses as they grow. The, the, the morphogenesis of the endometrium involves bud formation, tubulogenesis, the proliferation and branching of uh, uterine glands to form a functional tissue. And this tissue is, in fact, essential because it produces what's called a different kind of milk, uterine milk, or embryokines, a whole host of molecules that support pregnancy, conceptive survival, and fetal growth. And in fact, form dictates function where this tissue, and all tissues for that matter, are concerned. It, we know this. Because in model animals that we've, we've worked with over the years, where we've created adult animals devoid of uterine glands, you can't see this either, called the uterine gland knockout model, animals that we make that are adults that lack uterine glands, the UGKO phenotype, do not support pregnancy and are infertile. So uterine glands are essential for fertility in mammals. Now, in the pig, if we allow baby pigs to nurse, they consume relaxin. And we know that relaxin will induce the expression of genes in the uterus that are essential for glands to develop, as illustrated here with the uh, expression of the estrogen receptors. Some of you have heard this. 
And so when this happens correctly, we get the appropriate development of endometrial glands which further support reproductive performance in mammals in this example uh, from the pig. So what we've established is a mechanism actually involving the porcine endometrium where receptors for this, these bioactive factors such as relaxin acting in the endometrium induce a series or a cascade of events that's essential for the success of the organization of reproductive tissues in these animals, both in females as it happens in males. And we call this type of mechanism, based on our word, a lactocrine mechanism. So if this process, which is essential to reproductive success, is mediated in part through signals in milk, what happens if we remove the source of those signals by eliminating milk and creating what we call the lactocrine null condition? Are there consequences? And the short answer is yes. Indeed, if we disrupt the lactocrine program by, and alter the developmental program, we would expect that there would be an altered trajectory of development at the level of this tissue, as an example. And to test this type of hypothesis, it's pretty straightforward. We either feed, uh, let the animals nurse or feed them a milk replacer or formula, and we look to see what happens downstream. And when we do that, we see some rather remarkable effects. Great, you can't see that effect. I don't know what's up with that. But in any event, if you could see that, it's beautiful on the screen down here, uh, you would see that when we keep baby pigs from nursing, they fail to develop uterine glands. They fail to develop uterine glands. And further, if we look at the level of that impact at the level of the transcriptome, that is the total array of genes expressed by these tissues in the baby, we see, great, with assistance from the Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology, that in, on day two, there's as many as 900 differentially expressed genes between nursed and replacer-fed animals simply by virtue of our uh, inability to, if you could only see it down here, uh, our inability to uh, uh, consume uh, colostrum. And indeed, yay, a whole host of biological processes, including cell adhesion, cell-cell signaling, and the like, that we know to be important for the formation of tissues you know, are included among the, the pathways that we've identified using state-of-the-art deep sequencing. So we know that gene expression, uh, this one's not showing up either, it looks great here. We've also looked at genes uh, that regulate patterns of gene expression, gene products called microRNAs. And when we've looked at these, uh, we've found a whole host of microRNAs that actually interact with other messages. And as a consequence, none of this is showing up up here. Uh, and that's not showing up either. As a consequence, we've identified interactomes of transcripts that affect patterns of gene expression within the uterus, and there it is, and, and actually uh, looks something like this, where microRNAs interact with uh, or affect the relative stability of transcripts and can affect negatively and negatively regulate the expression of a whole host of genes that have been implicated by others in the course of organization of tissues of this kind. And so we can say then, in summary, that imposition of a lactic and null state from, for two days from birth alters the uterine developmental trajectory by two, day two of life, and that by doing this, there we go, almost 900 genes are affected differentially by uh, the absence of nursing. This affects the epigenetic program, the structure of tissues in the neonate, but beyond that, there are long-term consequences. Work with our friends at the USDA indicated that when we look at that population of animals, and this is over 300 animals and 1,500 litters. Those animals that consume a minimal amount of colostrum ultimately grow up and have dramatically smaller litters, a consistent with the lactic hypothesis that minimal colostrum consumption is associated with reduced uterine capacity to support pregnancy. And others have seen this. In addition to effects in the male that we have documented, others have adopted the, the term lactic. And in 2012, a working group asked the question, are there lactocrine effects on the infant's behavioral trajectory? Working in mice, a paper published recently in Nature Neuroscience con uh, concluded that there are lactocrine pathways that program offspring hippocampal development and memory in mice. And in primates, our friend Katie Hind at Harvard showed that cortisol in mother's milk, another type of lactocrine active factor, can be used to predict infant temperament. And so the broader impact of these observations is, being, is beginning to be observed across a host of different mammalian species. The bottom line here is that we are all mammals, and in all mammalian species studied to date, there's a period of time when maternal investments in development relate exclusively to milk. There are factors beyond nutrients that carry signals that affect organization and perhaps behavior and reproductive capacity in mammals beyond the pig. 
but I hope you will agree with me that we have evidence here to show that this is an important translational model uh, for the investigation of lactrogen activity in milk, which has implications for not only animal agriculture, but also for the development and our own capacity to address the challenges in days to come. The relationship then between lactrogen programming and neonatal development is being shown by us and others to have broader impacts than just, although that's very important, in the area of swine production. So I'll leave you with the Milky Way as we see it, which looks like this, the Via Lactea. And since there's no time for questions, I will acknowledge support from a number of agencies. And of course, you got to ask this question, right? You got milk. Thank you.